Focus. What are you focused on? What's in the forefront of everything that you do? Philippians chapter, chapter 3. Let's stand together in honor of the Word of God. Philippians chapter 3. If your neighbor doesn't have a Bible, let them let him look on with you. Look in verses 12 through 14. You talk about a, a focused person. Paul was focused. He says in verse Verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we ask, Lord, that you might help us to focus our attention this morning on your word. And as the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts, may we not neglect it. May we not push it off to the side. May we take it seriously. Help us to see and examine ourselves this morning as to what is really our focus in the Christian life. I pray that you would give me wisdom, uh, give me a disciplined mind this morning so that I, I would articulate the things that you want, not just the things that I want. In fact, not the things that I want at all, but what pleases and honors you. We ask God that you would speak to our hearts this morning. May you get the honor and may you get the glory through everything that's said and done this morning in this message for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, what, what are our main duties before God? What are, what are the things that we're to focus on more than, more than any other things? Well, we, we ought to be concerned about a number of things in the Christian life, as an example. We ought to be, we ought to be uh, you know, we ought to be concerned about prayer. Prayer needs to be a part of your life. Uh, spending time in the Word of God needs to be a part of your life. Uh, you know, the, the fact that, that, uh, that God has one book is an important doctrine. Um, you know, we, we understand that God has preserved our King James Bible so that when we stand up and we say, I have the Word of God in my hands, I'm not, I'm not just saying a fancy phrase that sounds good. I mean, I have the Word of God in my language, and I can understand it, and it's word for word what God wants me to have. I believe that. I think that is an extremely important thing to believe and a doctrine to have. We have liberty in Christ. Just talked about it a moment ago. I think that's extremely important. Uh, I was talking with someone here just this last week about the priesthood of, of the believer. That's an important doctrine. Uh, personal separation from the world and to God. That's, that's important. You've got to have that in your life. Um, revival. You know, I, I, know, I know some preachers, every time you talk to them, they, they say, they talk about revival. We need to have revival. We need to have nationwide revival. It needs to start in the homes. And, and, and I agree with that. I mean, th there's no doubt about that. If you don't think that, that America needs a revival, you're not paying attention to what's going on. Uh, soul winning, being a, being a witness, being a testimony. Is it important to win souls? Absolutely. Except, you know, but I, I have run into people along the way that say soul winning is everything. And that's their number one focus and push. Um, music. Music's important. Uh, you know, I, I, I look back over my shoulder and see what God did with me from when I got saved until today. In fact, I was talking to, I think it was Karen Corey just recently about this. And uh, uh, how that, that uh, you know, uh, God progressively changed my music. It's stronger now and, and, and better than it's ever been. It hasn't always been at this level. Uh, is it important? Absolutely. Absolutely it's important. Um, planting churches is important. Doctrine is important. And then you go from doctrine to, you know, your pet doctrine. You know I, know, I know some folks that are, are just, they're stuck on prophecy. Man, that's all they want to talk about is prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. 
But when, when we focus on any one of those, and those things are all good things. Don't, don't misunderstand. I am not downplaying any of those things. I'm saying those things can't be your focus. Something else has to be your focus. What is it? One of our men, David, I think it was you, preached, uh, preached or taught uh, recently, I think it was on a Wednesday night, and uh, made a comment about the fact that God often does things in threes, and he does. You see it all over Scripture. And so I immediately looked for what are, what are three things that God puts into the forefront that he says, if you, you know, these are, these are things you need to focus on in your Christian life. Now, all these other things are important. Don't get me wrong. But if any of those things get in front of the three things we're going to look at, you get out of whack. You, 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 you start emphasizing in a wrong way a good thing. It might be a good thing. You know, I know, I know folks that, that uh, you know, everything is standards or everything is music or everything is prophecy. Or, and it's easy to go that way. It really is. Uh, today, um, you know, it's easy to get caught up in, in the political scene. And, you know, you can relate what's going on politically to what the scriptures say about the last days. You know, you can put all that together. But don't lose your proper focus. We need to be focused on the right things. And we're going to take a look at, at three things that come to the forefront. And, and uh, you know, uh, the Lord made this real plain and real clear to me that these three things are the three things that need to be the impetus for everything else in our lives. But if these start taking a back seat, then we get, we get out of whack. And we don't look at things properly. And you make wrong decisions because of that. First one. Go with me to Matthew 22. We were just there in uh, Sunday school. But we're going to revisit it again. Matthew 22. And in Matthew 22... I want you to look with me in verses 34 through 38. Matthew 22, 34 through 38. It says, but when the, the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, speaking of Jesus, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. really doesn't give a whole lot of room for anything else, does it? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. First thing that I, I believe that we need to focus on is loving God. And I preached on this last week on, on, uh, on the first love. That ought to be your motive for everything you do. You do what you do because you just love God. You think about where you'd be today if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. What kind of situation would you be in? I got saved when I was 17. Man, I'm glad I got saved relatively early in life. Now, all my kids got saved a whole lot earlier than I ever did. My wife got saved earlier than I ever did. But I'm glad I got saved when I did. Because if I got saved in my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, uh, I, would have, I would have gotten into a lot of trouble and a lot of sin and a lot of muck and mire and had a, had a lot more baggage than I have today. You always have baggage because you're a sinner, no matter who you are. But uh, uh, I, I, am, I am thankful for what he, he's done. And that, that love for God... It needs to be the thing that motivates us. Why do you do what you do? You know, do you do what you do because, and do you believe what you believe and do you, do you live your life the way you live it? Because out in the forefront, I mean, 
out in front of everything else, out in front of the standards, out in front of the music, out in front of the prayer and the Bible and all that kind of stuff, you have a love for God, and that's motivating you. And in order for that to be number one, in order for that to be a focus, you need to submit your heart. The Bible says the heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. But we have to submit that heart because if you, I, I hate the, and you know I do, because <laughs> I've said it before, uh, I, I hate that phrase, F just follow your heart. Yeah, and you'll go down a dark path. <laughs> you don't want to follow your heart. Uh, your heart is deceitful above all things. In other words, there's nothing more wicked and vile and terrible than your heart. And it's not just talking about you know, Israel when they were rebelling against God. That's, the, that's, a natural, that's the natural state of our heart. And uh, God says, listen, you need to submit that heart to me. And one of the ways we do it is by loving God and loving him supremely. And when we love God like we should, it affects other things that we love. It affects our love for the family. It affects our love for others. It affects our love uh, for, uh, for our country. It uh, affects our love for the church. But we've got to have that love out in number one. Loving God first. That's first and foremost. Then the second thing. Go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Brother Sam Gipp really helped me with this one in particular years ago. He wrote a whole book on uh, pleasing God and the, the whole reason why we are created. And this is the second thing that we ought to be focused on, that ought to be in the forefront of our hearts and minds when we're living for God, and that is to please God. If you look with me in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, this is all taking place in heaven, and this is taking place around the throne. And let, let's go up to verse 9. We'll get it in context. And when those, those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, that's speaking of God, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The reason why God created everything was for himself. That means you were created for him. That means your primary purpose in life is to please God. It's not the other way around. It's not God's primary purpose in life is to please you. And that, that kind of thinking is being promoted today in Christian circles. Uh, that's not why we're here at all. We're, he's not, yes, yeah, is, can God be a blessing to us? Yes, he certainly can, and he wants to be. But we're here for him, and we're here to please him, and that's, that's our job. In fact, that's, that's our purpose. Our, our, our motive ought to be that we love God. Our purpose is that we ought to please the Lord. That's why we're here. We're here to, to bring him pleasure. And in order to do that, we have to, to submit our desires to him. And again, you know, he's not here for our pleasure. We're here for his. So it's not what I want that's important. It's what he wants that's important. And that means I need to know my God. And that, that gives you a motivation for, for knowing God. Uh, the passage that we started out in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Philippians chapter, chapter 3 says uh, just before where we started to read, Paul is saying that I may know him. Uh, and, and, you know, whenever I read that, that I may know him and the, 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 the fellowship of his sufferings, uh, he says that I may know him. Well, Paul knew God. 
I mean, Paul, Paul loved the Lord. He knew the Lord. But he had a desire. And, that, and he understood he could never plumb on this earth. He could never plumb the depths of God and who he is. And so he was constantly trying to get closer and closer and closer to him. Uh, the New Testament tells us if we draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to us. If we obey his commandments, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll reveal himself to us in special ways. Uh, one, of the, one of the purposes that we have is not only to please God, but in order to please God, we've got we've to know who he is. And, and that, that should, should change and affect the things that you want. That should affect the things that you desire. If, if pleasing God is at the top of your list, then where you live is not at the top of the list. What your health is is not at the top of the list. I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm just saying it's not at the top of your list. Uh, you want to be where God wants you to be. I, I get upset a little bit with some of the ideas I hear floating around Christianity, particularly in this state, you know, that, oh, it's a, this, is a, this is a horrible state governmentally, and the taxes are high, and so we, we just want to leave the state. Hold it. Is that what God desires for you, or is that what you desire? And, and I'm, I'm not saying it's not. I'm, not. I'm not criticizing anybody who's moved. I'm not. But what I don't hear in a lot of that stuff is... What does God want? What, what, and you have to forgive me for a minute. But sometimes what it sounds like is let New York go to hell in a handbasket. I'm leaving because I just don't, I don't like some of the things I see. You know, I don't like some things either. But there's folks here that need Christ. And you know what? If all Christians move out of here, there's going to be no witness left. I don't think that's a... I don't think that's what God wants, not at all. And so just you know, be careful with that thing. Submit your desires to him. You know, Jesus did that in the garden. You know, he says, he says, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, he submitted himself to the Father while he was on this, this earth, and and he submitted his own desires, and that's what we need to do. We need to, to love God first. We need to please God first. That ought to be right at the top of our list on our focus. And then the third thing is to glorify God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And these are the three emphases that I, I see Throughout, really throughout Scripture, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, we need to love God, we need to please God, and we need to glorify God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and look down to verse uh, 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. You know, when I, was, when I was newly saved, I was wrestling with different, different standards in my Christian life, what I should do, what I, what I should not do. And, uh, you know, thankfully, nobody ever came to me and gave me a list of do's and don'ts. I'm glad, glad they didn't. Uh, I'm glad I was able to work that out, you know, in my own personal life. But uh, somebody gave me a uh, gave me a, a standard, I guess you could call it, uh, something to measure things by, and saying, you know, if you don't know whether or not you're supposed to be doing a particular thing, just just uh, ask yourself this question: Does it glorify God? Can God get glory out of it? You know, is it something that pleases the Lord? Does He get glory? Does He get can you honor God doing that thing? And there were some things that I just pitched out of my life because I said, you know what? I can't get honor and glory through that. And if I do this, he can't get honor and glory through that. And again, are the standards important? Yes, they are. But you got to have the right focus that causes you to make those decisions. 
And if the focus is wrong, then eventually the decision will be wrong too. So glorifying God is, is, is something that ought to be our focus. Um, this this t- tells us how we ought to practice things in life. Love of God gives us a motive. Pleasing God gives us our purpose. And glorifying God helps us to understand what should be our practice. What should we do and what should we not do? You know, does it bring honor and glory to God? And then at that point, what we need to do is we've already submitted our heart. We've already submitted our desires. Now we get down to the nitty gritty. We submit our rights. We're living in a day and age where that's, that's the thing you hear all the time. Uh, this, whole, this whole business about abortion, it's become a very um, prominent issue in the presidential election. It's been a, become a prominent issue even locally. I heard a, I heard a uh, uh, political advertisement here just, just this week that was knocking a person because they were pro-life rather than pro-abortion and uh, basically hit the, the business of a woman has a, a right, you know. Uh, she has a right to listen uh, to her doctor. She has a right to, well, uh, got to be careful of those rights. Uh, we need to, as Christians, we need not to be worried about our rights. We need to be worried about what, what glorifies God. And when, when the glory of God is what is at the forefront, then we're willing to give up our personal rights. Um, you get in a position of authority, and you say, well, I have a right to be respected. Well, are you willing for somebody to walk all over you? If... If, if, if it means that you humble yourself and God gets the honor and the glory, are you willing for them to do that? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that in every case you should allow that to happen. There's times when you shouldn't, obviously. But, but my, my point is, whose rights matter the most? Is it your rights or is it God's rights? And, and uh, boy, that, that whole issue of surrendering our rights and not being concerned about what we believe we deserve. If, you know, if you surrender your rights, you know what I found? I found the envy goes out the door. If you surrender your rights, you don't get offended easily because somebody didn't recognize something you did. Because you want God to get the glory. You don't want it. You know, you don't want the honor, you don't want the glory, you want God to get the glory. So you submit your rights to him. And when you submit your rights to him, that, that, that shows us how to live. And that shows us how to do the things that we need to do th- throughout our day. Um, so those three things are the three focal points. It's loving God first, pleasing God first, glorifying God first. Now, again, those other subjects and doctrine and, and standards and all that stuff that we talked about, those things are important, but don't let the cart get ahead of the horse. Make sure that the focus is on loving God, pleasing God, and glorifying God. Now, what does the right focus do for us? Well, one of the things it does is it, it keeps you humble. It makes you realize, you know, we're not in control. God's in control. And let him have that control. It reminds us that it's not about us. Years ago, we had an evangelist come through here. And it just seemed like the main uh, thing, the main point that he hit all week long was, it's not about you, it's not about you, it's not about you, it's not about you. At the end of the week, I said, hmm, you know what? I don't think it's about me. (laughs) It's about the Lord. Uh, He's the one. That, that matters, I don't. And when you, when you follow these three, three focus points, loving God, pleasing God, and glorifying God, uh, I find that, that, that it not only humbles you, but it reminds you it's not about you. It, it causes us to put other things into perspective. And uh, 
what it does is it keeps us on track. Uh, if you keep those three things in the forefront, something else doesn't run away. With, uh, with, with your life. Something else doesn't, doesn't get out of, out of whack and out of balance. And the thing I want to leave you with, and this is not a, not a long message this morning at all. It's going to be a short one. But are you, are you known for those three things? You know, when it comes to your kids, do your kids know that you love God first? Does your wife, does your husband know that you love God first? By the way, if you love God first, folks will know it. They'll, they'll see it. You don't have to run around and tell them. You know, if you've got to tell them, then maybe you don't. But, you know, it's like the, like the bully, you know, who runs around and says, I'm the strongest guy and you, you need to listen to me. Well, he's saying that because he doubts whether or not he really is the strongest guy and he's got he's to verbalize it. You know what? If you really love God first, you don't have to verbalize it. I mean, you can tell others that you love God, but they'll see it. It'll be obvious. Uh, do, they, do they know that you want to please God first? You know, do, do, do people in your home know that you want to love God first, you please God first, and you glorify God first? Uh, if you want, if you ever want to know how you're doing, just go ask them. Go ask them. Go ask your kids. Go ask your wife. Go ask your husband. And, and see where you stand. How about at work? You know, we, we've got to be real careful of something. I think, I think we're all guilty of this. Um, we act one way at church, and we act another way at work. We act another way out in public. We act another way at home. It ought to, be, it ought to run consistent, right straight across the board. And uh, people at work need to know that, that you love God more than anybody else, that you, uh, you want to please God more than you want to please anybody else, that you want to glorify God. More than the, and by the way, if those three things are in your life and they're motivating you, people are going to see it. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be obvious. And we need to be more concerned about those three things than all the other stuff that comes along. Now, I'm not saying that the other things aren't, aren't concerns, but these three have got to be at the forefront. If they drop, that's when we start having problems. How about your friends? You know, we were talking, we were talking last night in men's prayer meeting about just, just the general attitude of people. And, it, it, you know, somebody was making comment that, you know, people are disgruntled today. They are. They are. Uh, people overall are not happy. I was going down. I had, I had two situations happen this week where uh, uh, one of them was... Uh, was a, a, a person, I don't know if you notice this around here, but pedestrians now think that they've got the right to step out in front of a car uh, in Auburn because they've put so many of those crosswalks in. Well, the idea of the crosswalk, I've always thought, is you look both ways and you see if anybody's coming, and if nobody's coming, you start to come, so that somebody comes around the corner and they see you going across the crosswalk, they slow down. But no, they'll... They'll wait until you get up close, and they'll just go just like that. You're laughing, so you've seen it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I, I had a person, I had a person uh, going, just decide to go across. There was traffic coming from, uh, well, it was, it was one of those single lane deals with, with an arterial in between. And they were walking, and they were walking across. And I didn't catch it until I was close to getting close to him, so I slowed it, I slowed it down. But, I mean, I, I stopped way before I came even close to them. And that person looked at me and went, <sighs> I wanted to stick my tongue out, wanted to give him one of these. I didn't. I'm glad I didn't. That would have been a terrible testimony. I had another case happen where I did do something like that. I, I, I stuck my tongue out at a guy because, because he got upset with me about something. But 
and I shouldn't have done that. You know what happened? In one case, I focused on these three things. On the other case, I didn't. And this kind of stuff goes on all the time in our lives. So we're, we're living in that kind of a society. The society has changed greatly over the years. You know what? That doesn't give you and I an excuse. If anything, it makes these three things absolutely vital. It makes these three things more important than ever. I mean, they've always been important. But if you follow those three things, you're going to stick out. And people are going to see it. You're going to see it at your home. They're going to see it at work. They're going to see it among your friends. They're going to see it in public. You know, uh, people, <laughs> you should not look like the rest of the world. And I, when I say that, I'm not talking, I'm not even, it's true. You shouldn't wear, you know, clothes like other people wear clothes who don't care about morals and so forth. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about just countenance. Are you saved? Are you going to heaven? Are you looking forward to the blessed hope? Well, then shouldn't there be some kind of pleasant look upon your face? You might not smile all the time. I don't smile. I actually I kind of wonder about some of you. It does have a silly grin on their face all the time. They're up to something. Uh, but, but there ought to be a, a pleasantness. You, good on, you know, when you're driving home tonight, or to, this afternoon, look at people at stop signs and look at their face. Look at the guy. Man, they're mad. They're angry. They're, they're upset. They're sad. That ought not be you. You've got a God that you're supposed to be loving. You've got a God you're supposed to be pleasing. You've got a God that wants you to glorify him. And people ought to see a difference. I, I walked into a place, this, this happened years ago, but I walked into a place to pay a bill. It was a local establishment here in town. I went in to pay the bill. And the, the, the lady was the same one that usually takes care of me. And uh, she, said, uh, she said something along the lines of, you know, uh, when you come in, everybody takes notice around here. I says, really? I'm that, I'm that ugly? <laughs> you know, I think that's really what I thought. I said, oh, I'm that weird? <laughs> they said, no, you always have a cheerful attitude. Well, I, I wish I always had one. It just so happened that I did when I went into that place. But uh, maybe it's because the bill wasn't as high as some of the other bills I've had to pay. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I do know this. People are watching what that told me was, they're looking at me. And it's not just because I'm a preacher. Because a lot of people don't know that. Uh, you can make a difference just by your countenance, but your countenance will be affected by your focus. Loving God, pleasing God, glorifying God. And when you're at church, you know, you're here to be a blessing. You're not here just to get one, and I hope you get one. I hope other folks give you a blessing. I hope the Word of God gives you a blessing. But even if you get no blessing, you should give one. But you can only give it if your focus is in the right place. What are you known for? Are you known for loving God, pleasing God, and glorifying God? Anything else gets ahead of those three things. You're in trouble, and you're going down the wrong road, and that's going to affect your decisions in life. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we ask you to help us. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. The hymnist wrote those words, and they're so true. They're so true of me. It's a constant battle, a constant struggle, but sometimes it's just simply my focus isn't in the right place. I'm not loving you like I ought to love you. I'm not glorifying you like I ought to glorify you, and I'm certainly not trying to please you. I'm trying to get what I want. And Lord, I pray that you get a hold of our hearts this morning. Help us to 
take those other things and put them in proper perspective. I'm not saying change the doctrine or get rid of it or, or uh, don't look at the standards or don't look at the music or don't, whatever it might be. But Lord, we need to put the thing that's supposed to be in the front in the front. And these three things, glorifying God, pleasing God, loving God, need to be the, the forefront of all that we say and do. Speak to our hearts this morning. There might even be somebody here this morning that's not saved. I don't know. It could be someone watching online this morning that does not know for sure that if they die today, they go to heaven. Lord, I pray that, that if that's the case, that this would be the day that they'd realize they're a sinner, that they're on their way to hell. And that uh, the only way they can go to heaven is by putting all their faith and all their trust in Christ. Repent of sin and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and believe on you. The moment they do that, you'll give them eternal life. And Father, those of us that are already saved, may we have our focus in the right place and put the first things first. Speak to our hearts. Have your will, have your way in our lives this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.